one stat I think that's really important to anchor this conversation is that according to a recent study, Canadian youth are the 58th most happy in the world. And that compares to Canadians in general being the 15th most happy uh, in the world. And I think as it relates to this conversation on productivity, it begs the question, why are Canadian young people so unhappy? Why is it that Canadian uh, young people, Canada ranks uh, uh, equivalent to El Salvador, a country ravaged with uh, crime and, and significant social challenges. Canadian youth are at that, that same level in terms of El Salvador. Uh, so a question to Deanna to kind of get things started. Why are Canadian youth so unhappy? I have all of the answers. Um, <laughs> Thankfully, through my work with uh, Teach for Canada, I am so blessed to work with youth across the country, but particularly First Nations youth. And we've been hearing a lot this morning about Indigenous participation in the economy, Indigenous participation in business and investment, um, but youth are still feeling left behind. And even though this government, Canadians across the country, have made reconciliation with Indigenous people a priority, and I can't speak, obviously, for all Indigenous people, I'm one, one human, um, there's still a lot of work to be done to ensure voices are heard. We do a lot of work with Indigenous leaders, businesses, to kind of ask, okay, how can we engage communities? But are we asking youth what they want? How many youth voices are present in these conversations? What do they want out of their education systems? How do they see themselves participating in business, in youth entrepreneurship? Are we asking them, you know, their ideas for the future? They're ready. There have been historic investments across the board in... Um, again, as I said, kind of education, but they're kind of landing a little bit flat as far as actual youth participation in those programs related to global learning loss from the pandemic. Students simply just not coming back to the classroom. Students having a little bit of mistrust in the education system overall. Parents maybe not sending their children to public schools anymore because there's that kind of lack of faith in education systems going forward. So I'd say, you know, to kind of answer the question, a general kind of sense of just disillusionment with what the future holds for us as young people. And we see it kind of across the board in housing as well. And we'll kind of chat about that a little bit more. But um, how can we kind of reinstill hope in the future for young people is something that we're kind of grappling with right now. And in the context of my work um, at Venture for Canada, where we support thousands of young people across the country to work in small businesses with the goal of fostering entrepreneurial skills, one of the reasons I see young people are so pessimistic uh, about the future and the present is housing. Uh, is that for many uh, young Canadians, uh, they can't afford uh, to buy a home or to uh, even rent. Uh, that uh, this has a huge impact on their career aspirations, on their uh, well-being. Uh, that if you can't put a roof over your head uh, and you can't meet that kind of basic need, uh, if not fundamental kind of human right, it has a huge impact uh, on uh, well-being. And I think as it relates to this productivity conversation, it's interesting earlier in the morning where uh, folks mentioned that the data started to change around 2014. And when folks mentioned that 2014 number, I thought to myself, well, what correlated with 2014? It was around that era where housing prices continued uh, to accelerate. And it's interesting to think around what is this link between the housing crisis and our productivity crisis? Because what I see firsthand is that so many young people want to create businesses but they're not able to because the cost of housing is so significant. If you're paying 50, 60% of your income in rent or mortgage payments, it's really tough to take the risk to create a business. And when we look at our productivity challenges, entrepreneurship and fostering more entrepreneurs, with the recognition that there are 100,000 fewer entrepreneurs in Canada today than there were two decades ago, is an existential part of, of how we address this fundamental uh, productivity issue. We chatted a bit backstage just about risk and the ability of, again, young people to want to incur risk. And I think it had been, been mentioned in a prior session as well, just around being able to move laterally across provinces. If I'm somebody who needs to upskill or retrain for a job, if I can't afford to move to Toronto or Vancouver from Thunder Bay or Fort McMurray or Whitehorse, I'll probably just maybe stay in my community because I have housing, it's a little bit cheaper. And we'll just kind of continue to chug along and maybe at the same job, even though I have those aspirations to kind of move. So how can we facilitate risk-taking among young people, among families? Someone also touched on um, childcare, the need for young families to have childcare so that maybe that person can go to the city to be trained. 
Um, bringing training to communities is something that we're really working on. Why should First Nations, why should rural people have to leave their home to be trained? It's going to be a long-term challenge. We need long-term investment in those kinds of programs. It's not something that's going to be solved overnight. But where is there a hybrid kind of happy medium? The pandemic was such a gift in that we've seen hybrid training models. We're seeing education and training programs going to communities themselves directly. And they have access to so many different resources, so many different opportunities that they didn't have previously. So it's those kinds of things that we can kind of lean on, continue to understand, so we can make education also more accessible for communities kind of across the country. And on that point of education, uh, a key part of education is how do we increase access uh, to work integrated learning for more uh, young Canadians, recognizing that students who participate in work integrated learning and post-secondary are proven based on studies to earn as much as 30% more upon graduation. Um, so recognizing uh, a key part of how do we foster a more productive workforce uh, is education, but also providing more young people with practical work experiences uh, that help them to be more productive in their lives and careers. And I think also a broader point is programs are important in terms of how we address this productivity uh, crisis, but so is culture. That as the old adage says, uh, culture uh, eats a strategy for breakfast, uh, I think is an important point. That when I talk to entrepreneurs who sell in Canada and the US, one of the things that they often uh, talk about is getting to yes, make it closing a sale in the United States is so much easier than it is in Canada. And even in my own life experiences, when you're selling something new, in Canada there can be this massive resistance to new ideas, to change, to risk. And I think an important part of how do we address this productivity issue is how do we create more of a culture that is open to risk and that recognizes that there is a risk in not taking risks. I've been reflecting on just, I guess, the importance of listening within that as well. Um, and the work that I do in engaging First Nations and youth, um, a lot of them already have ideas. And uh, rather than, again, showing up to community with, you know, we have a project and we want to move it forward and we have this deliverable and we're government or we're business and we have this timeline, it really is the importance of that long-term planning. So we've been chatting about long-term planning, but what does that mean? Education is not a sexy thing to invest in. It's not. We can build a school. We can see it. We have the shiny school. That's great. We see that kind of political kind of drive to say, okay, we did this, we did this thing. But education as far as supporting students and young people in a way that they need is something that we're maybe not gonna see that impact in one year, in five years, in 10 years, but in 10 years, that's actually the change that we're looking for, for Canadian productivity. We're looking for change in 10 years, so how can we have these conversations now? And we are kind of at this growth summit, but in pragmatic ways to make investments now that maybe we're not comfortable, we're comfortable kind of sitting on for a little bit longer so that we can see maybe in 10 years that we're actually making those changes that communities themselves already kind of know that they need and how they're going to get there. They know that already. It's just kind of listening. Uh, I'm thinking a little bit about Ed's comment at the beginning about how he's often uh, the youngest person in some policy, or he's sometimes the youngest uh, person in some policy conversation, uh, and that hasn't changed in 40 years. Uh, and I'm thinking of also the fact I was kind of laughing, we were laughing uh, to ourselves because we were like, oh, it's a nice compliment that we're considered youth. We're both in our early 30s. I'm, I'm almost 33, uh, which I think in the context of this space is like young. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, uh, in other spaces, not so much. Uh, and I think it's important to, to, you know, reflect on how do we involve more young people, uh, including folks a lot younger than us as well, um, in uh, policy making, uh, in decision making. And I think that you know, when we think of the, you know, um, how policymaking can sometimes uh, benefit older generations versus younger and, you know, the work of like Paul Kershaw and generation squeeze and generational inequities, there's many reasons, I think, why we have generational inequities in Canada. But I think partially is that young people are often not centered or sufficiently included uh, as part of policymaking uh, decisions. And there's a variety of, you know, structural, uh, you know, uh, pol political reasons for that. But I think if, uh, as part to link back to that productivity issue, if we're looking 30, 40 years out, it's critical that young people have an important uh, uh, voice at the table. I also see the prioritization of trades and young people going into trades in particular, um, especially in kind of remote and rural kinds of places, providing opportunities for youth, partnerships with schools, high schools, colleges, uh, to really make those kinds of professions. Like, they're so needed across the country. We've been talking about the need for infrastructure, but how do we build infrastructure if we don't have human capital? 
So really investing in those kinds of programs early on and making them again a lot more accessible for young people to participate or even just dabble in those, in those programs. Women in the trades is also something that uh, often a lot of initiatives are kind of done to recruit women into the trades, but how are we retaining women in the trades? How are we retaining young people? So there's always that recruitment piece, that human capital recruitment piece. But retaining staff long-term, again, is such a challenge. Also, of course, with the work at Teach for Canada, retaining teachers in the North, ret retaining physicians, health professionals in the North is always kind of this ongoing challenge. So how can we incentivize Canadians in general to see rural places, rural not necessarily meaning you have to go 500 kilometers north, rural can still mean southern Ontario, but how do we incentivize Canadians to see Canada as kind of like a whole country to kind of visit these places for one or two years? Sometimes that's all that is needed for kind of a construction project, a couple of years. It's all that's needed, needed for a school for maybe six months to just kind of find a teacher. Seeing Canada as kind of, a, we talk about whole of government perspectives, but Canada as a whole of country initiative to say, we need roads across the country to increase our productivity. So where can we fill in those gaps as a country to move forward um, is something that I think is also worth thinking about. Yeah. Okay, Scott, Deanna, thank you very much. Uh, just some thoughts to carry on as this day moves forward.